would be at the Book of Acts. If you don't, it will, you will notice you will be heading on that line. With, uh, you should be going around right now with the text and uh, the outline there. My goal today will be to move you and move us and move us as a community and move each of you, I hope by God's grace, from omission to mission. From omission, oh no. <laughs> From omission to mission. That will be my goal then. By God's grace that we would see some sort of change uh, both, in, both in, your, in, in the attitude about authority, your confidence in that regards. Perhaps your confidence in regard to power, whether you have ability. And finally, some confidence in terms of the scope of which you hope to see things happen. So I'm here, we're beginning in Acts uh, chapter 1. Now Acts is really the second book by this author. And he, uh, he has already written the book of Luke. And the book of Luke is all about Christ, his death and resurrection. So I want to begin with, a, with an introduction to the skeptic. I want to begin with the skeptic. At any time when I'm speaking to a bunch of people about this number, when I see people I don't know, I will and must and, and do assume that there are a number among you who, a number among us, who don't really believe this. For whom this is something that they have yet to commit to. And I'm going to talk a lot about the gospel today. The good news of Jesus Christ. And why is it good news? Now, Luke has an assumption about you and us, his generation and every generation, so does Jesus. Because there's an assumption running. The first assumption is this. We have the heart, man has the heart of a snake. That there is a, he wired into us a, a, an evil nature that is ready to strike. And you taste it every time somebody cuts you off in Atlanta traffic. Snake rears its head. The second problem that is acknowledged by the scripture is that you have a filthy past. Men and men and women have a filthy past. Filth marks the events, thoughts, attitudes, and words of every person. And the third problem is you have a toxic lifestyle. Your lifestyle and the way you live poisons your children, your neighbors. It's a pretty dismal out outlook on humanity, isn't it? But there, there's, there's an event, and we're, we're going to look at this person, Jesus Christ. There's, a, there's an idea that the God-man himself was able, that God was able to enter space and time and have a pure heart, no filth, and a life-giving life. And my joy, my, the gospel is good news, is that this generation, every generation, has an opportunity for a renewed heart, no longer the heart of a snake, a cleaned past, and a life-giving lifestyle. That's the fact of the God-man and his death and resurrection. That's what's in mind is Luke. Let's read. We'll see what we gain from this in our hearts. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. 
For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our hearts. Father, the ruin of our generation is all around us. It is in our government, it is in our culture, it is in our workplace, and it is in our families. It is on the, on the internet, and it is on the street. And we are a part of it, and we stand in it. So Father, we need a mission from you. We need a sense of your glorious mission. Would you speak to us today by the Holy Spirit? And will you, will you confound and alarm or awaken the skeptic? Will you rebuke the cynic? Will you encourage the seeker, the believer who needs to find you, wants to find you today? Lord, I give you glory and praise. I thank you for your son, Jesus. And I pray for the Holy Spirit to be, use me today. Something amazing would happen because you're here. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, I want to move from omission to mission. I want to move from the great omission of this generation to a sense, a clarified sense, <clears throat> of mission. Did you notice the text? It was a, there's a certain amount of comedy. There always is in the Gospels. I, I don't know if you, if you, if you know that, but one of the great vindications that the Gospels were actually written by the Apostles is the fact that the Apostles look like idiots all the time. And it's, a, it's just great. It really is. It's great comfort to all Christian leadership. And so you'll notice there are a couple things in here that happen. One of the things that happens is they ask him, are you going to restore all of Israel? Now, that, that, that point right there in verse 6, uh, where, where the, they ask him this question <clears throat> as, a, as a group, betrays a fundamental, let me repeat that, fundamental misunderstanding of any, everything Jesus had just said. What I introduced, the heart of a snake, a filthy past, and, and toxic, Christ had been talking about all those things, and about the coming of the kingdom in the gospel, and they were still asking questions about when the second coming was going to happen. They do the same thing a few verses later. Uh, they're, 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 there's this wonderful event called the Ascension. Now, uh, now, obviously, the Christian claim is that this God-man was able to die, rise from the dead, and ascend into heaven. Now, you might find that unbelievable. That's not my concern. It's what the text teaches as a, as a valid picture of his divinity. What are they all doing? It's very comical, right? How long, how long do you think they were doing it? You can picture a dozen or more men standing there going like this. And somebody goes, uh, hey, hey, I wonder if the angels actually had to speak because they didn't even see them yet. We think they were angels. Excuse me, why are you looking in heaven? The picture that is at the outset of Acts, and it's going to govern a part of the story of the unfolding of the church, of people, God's people, is an inability to get it, and to move into mission. 
If there's one thing I've seen in my tradition, my Reformed tradition, is a fascination with theology that has not led into mission. All conviction about who this God is without purposefully moving is doing what? Hey, you know, I'd like to know more about, I'd really like to know what this text says about when when Christ is going to return. What kind of millennialist are you, brother? Are you a pre-mill, historic pre-mill, ah-mill, post-mill? I'm a windmill. (laughs) Whichever way the wind blows. I'm not saying that discussions about truth in the scripture are not of inestimable value. There are beautiful things to talk about. But if you have replaced theological reflection with action, I'm not uh, moved into action. I mean, if you've replaced action with theological reflection, this is what I mean to say, then you are guilty of the same problem, of the idleness, of the, of the inactivity, of the, of the self-gazing. There's, in my tradition, if you've, you're walking into a Presbyterian church this morning, I don't know if you know this, but we, we, are, we are theological navel gazers, right? You know? Confessionally, it was, we, we get very busy like this, and, and we think there's value in this. There isn't, not in and of itself, unless it moves, unless it is alive with power and authority and unbelievable scope. And it doesn't make any sense otherwise. So I, I, the first bias of the text, you know, I put a quote there. I, it's not a quote, it's I, I, kind of an adaptation of a quote I read from Whitehead. Theology is like fish. It goes bad quickly if you don't use it. It doesn't keep. You got to do mission. You've got to do mission. Ministry is often, even in this generation, even here at St. Paul's, a spectator sport. And if you've treated ministry like a spectator sport, then you are not under gospel authority. You are not under gospel authority. You are not animated by gospel power. And you will not know the glories of the scope of the gospel reality in this generation. That is what the text is teaching us. Let's begin with gospel authority and the call to gospel authority. Several times in the text, uh, we, we talked about having, being under the Father's author- the sense of authority, the declar- declaration of Jesus. Uh, this is working itself out. It's, you know, it's the same. It's interesting, isn't it, that at the end, in Matthew 28, you get the same sort of final note in the, com- in the, in the Great Commission, and, which is a great, another great picture of the same, same issues we looked at uh, a couple months ago. And you get this picture that at this point where Christ has risen from death has, and, and vindicated his his, his teaching that he's this unique, he's the son of man, the son of God, he, he, he addresses with unparalleled authority. Authority is the, is the big central theme all of a sudden. He has authority. He has authority. And here it's even called the father is fixed by his own authority. The father's authority and the son's authority work in complete sovereign kingly union. To affirm what? <clears throat> you are under authority and you have authority. <clears throat> uh, uh, when, I get up, when I get up in the morning and I stop at Starbucks to get my coffee, I, I, get, I always get my coffee in the morning on Sunday mornings and I stop in and there's a bi- biology professor. I don't know, she was a biology professor. I don't know why she works at Starbucks. And uh, she always asks me, or whenever she gets a moment to, Amy knows her, she always says, what? What do you, what do you, what do you, what's your lecture about today? And she asked me, what's your lecture about today? <clears throat> and I went, <clears throat> mission. And I, I, the, minute, the, minute, the minute I was asked about it, I, I, I did not want to say it was about mission. Why? Because we have been bullied by this age into thinking that we don't have a right to speak. And I feel it in my bones. It's like an instant reflex. 
So I know that there is, there is a tyranny, and I think it's a demonic one, frankly. I, there is a tyranny of this age that says, you have no right to tell me what to do with my body, with my heart, with my life, with my money, with my belief, so you can go blank. Right? And we're, it's intimidating. But uh, if, there's, if, if there's something that kind of, kind of comes out of this, this, this idea, and it comes out of, Paul, uh, of the way Jesus ends, this, ends his ends ministry, is his, his claiming, you're under authority, and I've given you authority. You're under authority, and I've given you authority. Now that authority right here is mysterious, right? You don't get to know what happens, right? You don't get to know things, because he has authority. But you get to know what to do, don't you? You get to know what to do. You get to know what to believe. You get to be under authority. So, right out the gate, why ought you to move from omission to mission? Because you're being disobedient in your silence. Did you know that? There's a common thing in my generation, in my culture, right here in Midtown, that says silence equals death. And that was about HIV and AIDS, the need to be public and open. I tell you, they were right. They were more right than you could have ever guessed. Your silence equals the death of this generation when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you may say to me, I don't, really, I don't want you to guilt me into sharing my faith. I want to suggest to you that some guilt comes from the Holy Spirit. Amen? Look, I am not here to guilt you, but if God makes you feel responsible for your silence because you have allowed this generation or the campus or your work to bully you into silence, then I urge you to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. But I urge you also, the authority of the Father here, but I also urge you for the flip side, lay hold of that authority. I think of uh, the passages that are so beautiful in the Gospels. I have given you authority, says Jesus, when he talks to his disciples. There's a certain authority over, over, over this generation. Now it's derived, and it causes us to be humble. It calls us to humility. But we have an opportunity. You really do have the authority to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. You have a right. It was given to you by our Father himself in the mouth of Jesus Christ. So stop being so bashful. Don't let the world lie to you that it's inappropriate for you to share your faith. It's a lie. Let's move from omission into mission, gospel mission, with gospel authority. What else do we need, though? I, uh, I, I don't want to even entertain an idea, and, I, and I love, one of the things I love about the Scriptures, one of the things I love about Jesus and I love about my Father is that nothing He commands does He not give me what I need to do it. And that's the next part of the text, His power. How shall we venture upon such a concept of speaking for a God to a generation that hates, that hates what we believe? How shall we dare, how will we propose it? We have to go with power. And it's all about the power of the Holy Spirit. But uh, three times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the text. Verse 2 is, is mentioned uh, as being the very power by which Christ himself spoke. In verse 5, it's called the power that he, he will, um, uh, he, the, the Holy Spirit will be said, just the Holy Spirit. And then it'll says power in verse 8 of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Holy Spirit is mentioned three times in the text. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an even deeper idea here that if you kind of pay attention to it, there's a, um, there, there's a promise of the Father in verse 4. This is coming out of the mouth of Jesus in verse 2 and verse 8. He's speaking as the Son, the God-man, and it's in the Holy Spirit. What is this telling you? That in the venture presented, in all the authority of God from eternity, and this program of mission, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who we praise at the end of every service, who we, who we baptize in His name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the fullness of God 
is what's operating in mission. The fullness of God's person. All that God is is there. All that God is for all that you are. And that's supposed to give you hope for power. If you believe you don't have the ability to share the gospel, you're believing a lie. You really do. From the simplest of you to the most, to the most elegant or well-trained. The most, the most educated. Yes, you do. Everything else is just unbelief. Power. What is, what's this generation like? You know what this generation is like? What should I compare this generation? I have a story of a little boy. Well, when his dad got home, he was visibly nervous. And his dad said, what's the matter, son? And he said, well, dad, I have a question. Is something lost if you know where it is? Is something lost if you know where it is? And his father said, no, of course not. The boy sighed a sigh of relief, and he said, okay, Dad, great. Your keys are at the bottom of the well. <laughs> not lost. <laughs> you know where they are, but you can't get to them. Don't you feel like the New Testament and the advent of fire is like that for the Christian church. Like all of God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit is disposed to the energy and all of the eternal power of God. And we're like, it's like on the other side of a steel grate we can't get to. What has become of us? You know, they're going to go to pray. I'm going to say, I, I don't have a praying church as a pastor. And it breaks my heart. And I, want, I don't want to invite any of you to prayer. Why? Well, what's the point? But oh, that I had to figure out, oh, that I had the problem of a people who demand that we pray, will be there to pray, so that we might touch and know all of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in going from what? Omission to what? To mission. And I, 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 there, there's a couple things I think need to happen here. One, that we become a people seeking after God. Okay, don't come to any prayer meeting for the rest of our time at St. Paul's. I could care less if you're a woman or if you're a man who are on their knees to see the Holy Spirit and see all of our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit involved in the rescue of this generation. Amen? The rescue of Midtown. It may never be public. But I venture, I venture, because we're so locked away from spiritual power that there is a deep prayerlessness, deep within our psyche, a deep unbelief. Unbelief about prayer is also mirrored by unbelief about the presence of God's power in just the gospel. I want you to visit with these disciples for just a moment. It's only been 40, 50 days since the resurrection. It's only been, it's only been a, a couple of months since they were witnesses to all sorts of things. So Peter remembers. How many of you have a lingering memory? Maybe you're fairly immediate of your own personal betrayal. Peter did. How many of you have a memory of, of conflict, of everything going dark, everything going, going south, everything becoming a ruin, in which you face the utter collapse of everything you had built? James had seen it. How many of you took off, whether in the work or family situation, and the minute an opportunity to stand for faith or belief with your family or your neighbors immediately got quiet? That's what John did. Peter, James, and John had done all those things. You get it? But by turning, it was all lingering right there. By now turning to Christ in prayer and in faith for hope for who they were, they were endowed. They were, they were anointed. They were set free. 
to bring about the mission of the gospel with power. So what is that story supposed to tell you? It's right there for you. Do you believe the gospel? Do you know your sin? No, it's, no, no, it's forgiveness. And have you turned from it to the living God and sought him for power? This is who we're to be as a, as a people. This is, who we, this is what I want. I don't want Acts 1, Acts 2 to be locked away in a biblical text. I want it to be lived out at St. Paul's. New gospel glory will come when we together confess our viper hearts, our hearts of snakes and our filthy past and our toxic lifestyles, are looking for Holy Spirit power to renew us and are now bringing that news with joy to this whole generation. That's Holy Spirit power for us. We have authority. We ought to have power. What's your scope? How big do you think? One of the great gifts that was given to me by a leader of the faith was that expression, attempt something so great for God that it's doomed to failure unless God is in it. Did you hear that? Attempt something so great for God in your family. Attempt something so great for God in your, in your workplace. Attempt something so great for God in this generation that it is doomed to be a miserable failure unless Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are engaged. What a noble, beautiful, worldwide, universal call we've been invited to participate in. Are you ready? Do you have a vision for it? The scope of the good news. There's this idea that it's all that God is for all that you are to all who you know. I have this sense. Uh, there was an old sense. There's an old, old gospel preacher, I think it was Wesley, who said, you light a fire in your heart. This is his advice to preachers. You light a fire, you kindle a fire in your heart, and people will come just to watch it burn. Don't you think that's a hundred times more true about a church. So if we were to kindle something here by the power of the gospel, what might happen? I wonder. It seems to me right here, we're right on the cusp of we, we haven't asked for enough or hoped for enough of what God can and will do for the generation, for, for, for all the communities around us, the sexually broken, the materialistically enslaved, the, 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 in, 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 enslaved on the streets to, to addiction. To every, all around us, we're in a sea of brokenness. It's just constant. It just breaks up account of St. Paul's all the time. Who is equal to the scope? How can we imagine it? We have authority. We have power. Is your vision big enough? Large enough, both in scope and hope for this generation? Or did you go through gay pride and shake your head and say, there's no way anything can ever happen here? I want you to have a sense, how should we walk into this then? How should we walk into this mission? Now, if you know the story of the book of Acts, you'll find that this expanding, the, by the way, there's circles here, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Concentric circles are mentioned in, in verse 8. There's, there's Jerusalem, then there's Judea and Samaria, then there's the ends of the earth. The church only moves through those circles as she is persecuted, as the program gets interrupted, and as God moves it out. There's conflict, there's frustration, people leave the church, they don't like it, I wonder if we're even prepared for what God will do in the church and through the church if indeed we'll move from omission to mission. I really mean that. But if we'll begin to become a people who are in love with the true gospel of Jesus Christ for who we are, a fire will burn here and it will send embers all over the world. I, uh, and it's so unpredictable. I, in this picture too, I, um, when we came here, when I first came here 15 years ago, I remember um, having a heart for Midtown and a heart for 
uh, the homosexual community, which I still have a heart for, and, and, a, and so deeply thankful to be a servant of and in. And, uh, and then I remember how um, I did a little Bible study at a, at a, at a Georgia Tech fraternity uh, called KA. And I forget, eight or nine guys came to Christ that first year, something like that, right? Something like, I can't, depends on how you count it. Depends whether you count Ryan or not. And, uh, and so uh, a bunch of guys come to faith. And I remember it wasn't inside my vision. It really wasn't. I don't have any particular love for Southern frat boys. I mean, I do now, but I didn't at the time. Not only did they seem as far from God as possible anyway, they had viper hearts and a filth. You ever been to a fraternity house? A filthy lifestyle. Talk about toxic lifestyles. But the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, entered that fraternity. And the president of that fraternity became the leader of our HIV program, working with AIDS patients who were dying. That was not predictable. <laughs> that was not something you could anticipate. So it is with the kingdom. And I wonder, I wonder again and again, if we are ready to think outside of boxes, think outside of categories for, you know, there are these concentric circles right here in one neighborhood. There are people who, there are concentric circles of, of groups of people that are not, that are outside of our purview, right? That are outside of our reach because we don't see them as possible gospel candidates, as it were. They don't fit And there's a beautiful sense, and, and, and so, but, but to, to, to begin to think in terms of, like, who do you, who do you come here and wish, who, all right, you come to church on Sunday morning, is there anybody who comes to our church who you are hoping doesn't sit next to you? We need to be from O mission to mission and get out of the comfortable categories there is still too much homogeneity in this community. All right, I'll give it to God. My father does what he wants. If he likes white people more, that's fine. He doesn't. It's ridiculous. But you better, it better not be because you like white people more. You get that? We are to be a vision of something new and amazing. I, uh, maybe it goes back to prayer. When I was a little kid, my dad dug foundations. He would dig foundations all the time. And um, I remember he would get a new delivery of sand in the back, in the back, uh, back, back behind the garage. And you need sand and gravel to make a foundation. And he would, uh, so a new, whenever a new sand shipment would come, I would go and play in it. I'd be all excited because a new sand shipment had come, right? And I think sometimes we have to have that kind of heart with Jesus praying for new sand shipments to play in all the time. Hoping and looking and seeking and thinking outside of the box, out of our sandbox, for God to deliver something new for us. I'm hoping that there'll be a new availability, a new passion a new hope in the gospel, and a new authority to go, a new being under authority and with authority, and a new sense. Look, I, I uh, and then you will learn by going where you have to go. It's all around you. And I'll tell you this, if you are not a part of the expanding reality of the kingdom, you're not in the kingdom. Even if it's a helping part or a connecting part, because this is what it looks like where the authority of the gospel has been made real. And this is what it looks like when the Trinitarian God has become active in redeeming this generation. This is what it looks like. And so brothers and sisters, I encourage you. I, I encourage you to new boldness, new discovery of the gospel, new joy in the gospel authority. And so what will happen? Look, I, this is what will happen. That you and I, us as a community will realize that Midtown, Tucker, India are suffering with the heart of snakes 
are encased in the excrement of their filth and their past and are living toxic lifestyles, destroying, poisoning everybody around them. And because you were redeemed from all those things, because you were given a new heart, because you saw the power of God to save and clean and transform, and that life could come through you, you would be a person, an emissary, an announcement of the presence of this God and His power. And the Holy Spirit would work in and through you now to bring a story of redemption to this generation. 